I want to give a special shout out to my patrons, to my Bibliosprand, Biblioswarn, and Bibliomancers. Thank you so much for supporting my hobby and passion even more. It means a lot to me. Hi everyone, Patek here. In today's conversation with authors, we have the author behind The First Binding, one of my favorite books of the year so far. It is R.R. Vilby. So Ronnie, can you introduce yourself first to the audience? Yeah, and thanks for having me, by the way. Uh, I'm, I go by Ronnie as my nickname, but uh, R.R. Verdi published. I've been writing mm. for about 13 years and publishing for about eight to nine at this point. Um, you've already covered this in your videos earlier. I, I predominantly started self-publishing, mm. mostly with urban fantasy. And then this is my debut uh, traditional epic fantasy that I'm starting my career again with, I suppose. Oh, so it's kind of like a restart? It, it is like I haven't given up self-publishing, but this is such a genre shift for me and it's brought such a new level of attention to my career. A lot of people are treating it like my first book ever, weirdly. Ah, <laughs> what made you decide to actually switch? I mean, you at the, uh, at first you are you, you are writing urban fantasy, right? And then now you are switching to epic fantasy. What made you decide to do that? Uh, believe it or not, at the point where I was at, this was about 2018, uh, when I decided, when I first conceptualized this novel, uh, oh. which didn't actually even start as this novel, it started as a different standalone novel, and the storyteller was originally going to be a different character in there, and uh. it turned into something else, I'm like, okay, now he gets his own series, and then I still have the standalone, but I was just talking on Facebook, oh, uh, I was rereading poetry, I was rereading The Wise Man's Fear, uh. and I was also reading... Um, Gerard Manley Hopkins, who was a poet who was extremely lyrical mm. and his rhymes are just unreal. Um, he almost has similar cadence in a way and almost like a classical version of Eminem, which sounds really <laughs> weird, but he makes words rhyme that shouldn't rhyme. And it just feels uh. beautiful. And I was like, I'd like to tell a story like this one day. And a lot of people on Facebook were like, you shouldn't do it. There's no market for it. Um, you probably won't sell. And then Jim Butcher shows up on there and he's like, if you write this to the best of your ability, don't worry about the genre. Don't worry about how different it is. Just the best book that you want to write for you, it will sell. And I was like, Whoa. okay. And it became a sideways passion project while I was still working on other books. It was like, I'll do this for me to make myself happy. Uh, and I had about 30 to 40,000 words done at this time. And again, it was a passion project. I was like, yeah. oh, maybe I'll sell it to Audible because it's really lyrical and they would love an oral, oral storytelling story. And then I was at the Nebulas in 2019 where I was a finalist uh, for best novelette with a friend of mine. Oh, nice. And I bumped into my agent, oh, who would become my agent, Joshua Bilmish there. Ah, and yeah. all the other agents who were talking to me were like, oh, that sounds like a cool project, but it's going to be way too big. You, you can't publish a book like that. And Joshua's first words were like, well, I published Stormlight. So <laughs> don't worry about the size of it. And I was like, okay. And then later that year, I bumped into my editor first. I hadn't actually gotten represented by Joshua. I, I queried him, but I guess he was busy or whatever. We didn't go anywhere with it. And then my eight, the my editor from Tor was reading this. And a month later, he's like, yeah, we need to have a phone call. Mm. And I was like, okay, why? And then he was like, we want to buy the series. I was like, ah. oh, okay. He's like, do you have an agent? And I was like, not really. He's like, go pick one. I was like, oh, okay. And then I went back to Joshua. And Joshua was like, I need to read this. I haven't gotten around to it. I'm sorry. And he reads it. And he's like, yeah, let's do this. And then a few months later, the, the series sold in internationally to go links and tore off the sample which was which was nuts it wasn't even done yet <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't even done yet <laughs> had literally the end of chapter 10 or the original 10 which is the chapter brahm where you read where ari's telling the story to uh his childhood friend nisha oh but that's brahm. all i had yeah ah uh, yeah yeah i love that chapter though it's really cool thank you <laughs> so uh, in the first binding, you are using a framing narrative, right? And mm -hmm. that's something that's, I mean, I know that it is very popularized because of the King Killer Chronicle by Patrick mm -hmm. Rothfuss, but even then, compa in, in comparison to a lot of epic fantasy out there, not a lot of epic fantasy actually use that. And what made you decide to use a framing narrative? So for me, believe it or not, while yes, King Killer is an inspiration, I'm not going to deny that. I genuinely yeah. love that series. It actually comes to the roots of when I was studying, because before even uh, I became a writer, I've always loved mythology. And mm. I learned, I love learning history through mythology, not necessarily through history. And the greatest epics, a lot of them use framing narratives. And I mm. think what emotionally connected me to those feelings so epic might have been that technique. Um, uh, like I got introduced them so young, like the Mahabharata is a framing narrative. Yeah, yeah. It's an epic poem, but it has nesting stories within that. And it adds this extra level of depth and grandeur, to me at least. Hmm. Um, the Odyssey, in a way, always felt like one to me. Uh, depending on which versions you read, it's not told as one. 
But at the end of the day, it's this giant epic about Odysseus. And you hear tales within tales about like, why yeah. is the Cyclops like this? Uh, the story of the Bag of Wind, um, little even one line or two snippets that imply greater stories about Scylla and Charybdis. Uh, and I was like, it just feels like it brings a deeper level of interconnectedness of the world and mythology using a framing narrative. Mm -hmm. So when I was like, this is a love letter to storytelling, as well as parts of my culture and not just the Mahabharata, I'm like a framing narrative just felt the right way to tell the epic of Ari while still giving him a present day progressive story. Like he's still doing things today. He's not an active character. Yeah. But there's something grand that brought him to this point at the beginning of the, the first book. Mm -hmm. And it just felt like the perfect way to tell multiple stories, but still have them be cohesive and bring that depth and that love and nod to historical storytelling. Mm, nice. <laughs> I love I love framing narrative and I agree with everything that you said. I mean, it also gives a lot of connection to the past, a long, long past, right? And I love mm -hmm. that. I love reading something like that. I, I mean, that's also kind of why I love epic fantasy in the first place. Even when they don't use framing narrative, sometimes we get hints of that in the, in the narrative. And... You know, one of the first things that immediately caught my attention to the first binding is the cover art by Felipe de Barros, right? And it is yeah. gorgeous, man. This is a gorgeous cover art. I know. And, uh, I know. <laughs> did, you, did you actually have any say in this or this is all up to the artist? Believe it or not, yeah. yes and no. The way this happened was um, when I was originally writing this, I, I, I didn't think it was going to sell. I, I thought it was too weird. I didn't know who would like it. And I commissioned Felipe personally for art for myself. Like we, we did it like game design where it's concept boards. And I've, I've shown you some of those pictures. Before. Oh yeah. 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 And then I showed this to Tor, like, Hey, these are just some of the visual inspirations. And Tor got back a little while later, like, Hey, we love all of these. Uh, who's the artist? <laughs> and I was like, Oh, it's my friend Felipe. And they're like, cool. And they came back like, so we're just going to take the, the art you already sort of did and have him redo it to be better. And I was like, oh okay I was like, cool so i sort of got to direct it by getting ahead of the curve which is and you're the only person who's seen this but you've seen the the storyboard art for book two. Oh yeah my and god the implication, it's, it's so cool man yeah. it's so cool it's the same thing i'm sort of trying to secretly direct my cover art i hopefully tor tor will ignore this part but uh i'm trying to i guess teach them what to do before they get it <laughs> ah. i'm gonna show them that too like here look here's some great art already done and yeah. then they hire felipe and go like hey just do that again <laughs> Let's repeat what works for book one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so obviously this is a very ambitious book. I mean, it is 350,000 words long and there must be a lot of research done into this one, right? Or inspirations. What were the, the hardest research that you've done for this one? Uh, so it wasn't the mythology, believe it or not. It was trying to get the historical interplay right. And what I mean by that is because uh, for me, the story of South Asia is really the story of the Silk Road because these countries at this time were not isolated. There was mm. so much trade, migration, culture being shifted along, different religions were sprouting up and as well traveling to different places. Um, currency exchange uh, and storytelling along those roads. And we mm. know uh, you actually mentioned such a beautiful line in, in your review of my book where you brought up truth bows to bias. Mm -hmm. And we see this today with, with the internet, how fast misinformation can travel. But imagine yeah. back then where you have no immediate way to source check stuff. So yeah. I was like, okay, I know how the stories will travel around this world and evolve, but I need other things to bring that Silk Road to life. So I had to do a lot of historical research from a book called... Um, Silk Roads, A New History of the World by Peter Frankopan. Mm -hmm. And that brought in a lot of the historical side of what else was happening on the Silk Road that I could bring into my world and do differently or new. But it at least makes my version of the Silk Road believable. Because I had mm -hmm. to have these other things happening in the background, which you see where people are talking about, oh, there's inflation happening and it's a quick passing line, mm -hmm. but implies trades going wrong and that there might be war happening. And then, of course, there's me tying into how is this Ari's fault or implied it's his fault. But I had to have this other world existing behind the present day stories and oh. figuring out how to make that happen took a lot of history that is not my passion and forte, because uh, I still believe the best working historian author for SFF for that kind of fantasy right now is probably S.A. Chakaborty. Uh, ah, Bress. Yeah, yeah, because her history is insane. And I'm like, I, I, I am definitely more on the storytelling mythology <laughs> side than historical hard facts side. <laughs> I still have to read that trilogy, you know. I haven't read it. <laughs> yeah, you might really enjoy it. I'd definitely go into it knowing that she's she is definitely a history buff, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I actually I actually gave the first book, uh, City of Brass, a uh, try uh, a long time ago, but 
uh, there was a lot. Uh, there was a lot of kind of info dump. So as you said, it yeah. is it is very full of historical stuff. Yeah. Yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So I thought I might as well give it a try someday when I'm in the right mood for it. Mm-hmm. Mm. So you included a lot of South Asian inspiration and South Asian elements into the world building of the first binding. And was this something that you've always wanted to achieve? I mean, I am not complaining. I love something like Brahms. <laughs> Brahms was something uh, I've heard about, but never kind of look into it more until I've read mm. this book. And then Ashura obviously have been mentioned in a lot of medias. And I love those. Was this something that you've always wanted to do? Believe it or not, mm. uh, not really. It wasn't like, I had this burning desire to do it. Then I've always loved the mythology, hmm. but part of the reason I went to originally urban fantasy was it felt like a more natural ground for me to bring in mythology from different cultures. Cause you have the history of TV shows like supernatural. Hmm. Then you have books like Dresden files and so many urban fantasies that bring mythological creatures and monsters into this, this mishmash playground where everything from every culture is welcome. And I thought that would be the more natural playground for that. But when I started creating this series, it started evolving so fast and it became so quickly rooted in South Asian culture, at least for the first book, mm. um, that it just became natural the more and more I read it. It's like, I want to do this piece, but this piece is connected to this, which is connected to this, which is inspired. From, and it became this giant like flowering tree of, mm. if I do this one thing, I need these larger interconnected things to play with. And it just felt natural. Um, and I have no problem saying this because it's not a spoiler, but yeah. it's not only going to be South Asian mythology. As mm. the series goes on and Ari journeys across the Golden Road, uh, which is my world's version of the Silk Road, a lot more other cultures are going to come up. And I'm taking the same, I guess, tactic to it as Tolkien did for uh, European mythology, where he went to pre-Arthurian uh, European mythology. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. for a while it was very dominated by the Arthurian tales. And then he went back to the Norse epics and other things that defined Europe's mythology and history. So prose Edda, Beowulf, epics like that, symbology from that. And then he put it anew into Middle Earth and gave it mm. a new life. Yeah. And the way I felt of doing it was that's the best respectful thing I can do because I'm not a history buff. I shouldn't use real South Asia, real China, real Mongolia. Yeah. I should take the core of what make their mythology and history beautiful put them in a secondary world and let them re-evolve into what they would naturally be in this world with different gods and different creatures and different history. Mm. And then put Ari as a stranger experiencing all that because it lends a different kind of truth to where as a stranger along the golden road, he can never claim they're his cultures. So he's never (laughs) representing them. He's just seeing them through his lens. And you always know inherently it's through his lens. It's not always going to be hundred percent accurate. So he's never representing or misrepresenting a culture then. He's oh. just seeing it through his eyes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get what you mean. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, uh, in this book, I mean, I definitely have missed a lot of things, right? I mean, uh, there's a lot of theories. Uh, there's a lot of stuff for theories here. And I'm just going to assume that you are a From Software fans, right? <laughs> Diehard From Software fan. I have definitely played all their games, except Elden Ring, um, up to the conceptualization of this book. I think I got into Dark Souls within two weeks of the console release because I wasn't a PC player at that time. Uh, and my best friend had just gotten it on Xbox and he's like, yeah, I'm playing this game right now. And then I see him cursing and I was like, are you okay? <laughs> What's going on? And he's just like dying in the, the tutorial dungeon for the first Dark Souls. And I was like, okay, I'll try this game. And then I get it and then I start cursing, but I'm a, a more <laughs> aggressive personality type at times than him. So I'm like, uh, okay, you challenge me. I'm going to challenge back. And I just started grinding through it and it became my favorite series. Yeah. And then it wasn't until I started really paying attention to the artwork and stuff on a second playthrough. I'm like, wait a minute. Why are all these items having all this flavor text? Like, yeah. is this just for coolness? And, yeah, yeah. and I start putting stuff together and I'm like, oh my God, they're telling stories through this. Exactly. This stuff means stuff. And I was like, yeah. this is really cool. I've never seen storytelling done like this. And then as we go on, obviously, you know, uh, the most uh, prominent theory crafter for that franchise is Avati Vidya, yeah, who I became yeah, a massive Vati. diehard fan for. <laughs> and watching how From Software has created stories and tells subtler storytelling that you don't need to enjoy the games, but if you mm. do, it adds another depth. Definitely colored me in how I want to continue telling stories. And I, I do admit I've done much of the same thing in this. Um, and obviously, King Killer Chronicles has done it. Um, mm. A lot of framing narratives have these where little stories exactly just the, little stories. Mm, this is why I love framing narrative. One of the main reasons and it's really, uh, how does it? It is. It is really evident in your book. This is why I said there is still so much stuff to explore here. I I bet in book two and beyond that it will be more interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One of the most fun things I've had so far in writing book two has definitely been 
paying off some of the more overt promises I made in book one. So mm. fans get that kind of catharsis and they don't feel like they've been led on, but also secretly building on the theories from book one. So if people pay attention, they'll be like, oh, this is going somewhere, or this means this, or if they're being misled, which I, I admit I'm also doing because that's part of the fun of being an author to yeah, set yeah. something else up. <laughs> um, but I get to tell a lot more stories than people realize with, with the books as they go on. Mm. And hopefully it will lead to people rereading the first book after they get the second to also see what they might have missed because there's some secrets that you'll only be able to really understand once you read book two and the yeah. same book three and going back forward and then it just adds another level of joy i wanted this to reward readers for continuing to be invested in the world because i'm a reader like that i love diving back in to yeah. the same book and seeing things i missed but it just gives me a better appreciation for the book yeah and right now i'm in a dilemma whether i should reread after or before I read book two. <laughs> <laughs> I will you know, say, oh, go ahead, please. Nah, I'm just, I'm just wondering because one of the most complex things about uh, the first binding is the magic of bindings. Uh, how did you come up with this one? This is something that's interesting, very interesting. So I just forgot how to word this because I want to be very polite too. Um, <laughs> right now in fantasy, there's a, there's a popular zeitgeist for hard magic. Yeah. And... Uh, I like hard magic, but after a while, especially being an author and you're a reviewer, so we read so much, hmm. um, hard magic has sort of lost the the feeling of magic to me, if that makes sense. It feels mm. a lot more like a tool. I know, I know. And as an author, narratively, I've always felt like if magic is a tool, it should be a tool that has consequences and a tool that should hold your protagonist at risk. Um, I feel like magic should allow your character just to survive. It shouldn't be how they solve problems and win without hmm. great cost. Hmm. And after also feeling like magic has not felt magic I was like, how do I create something that has what's most important to me is what I call a sense of wonder. Oh, uh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And I always believed that with the more numinous magic systems, but their problem obviously is they can get very hand wavy. Mm -hmm. And I went into this very much with the intent of, can I create something in between, something like yeah, middle yeah. magic, mm -hmm. that you have rules of hard magic, but because of what they pertain to, and in here, this isn't a spoiler, but the bindings work on belief and faith. And yeah. faith is tenuous. It's mm. not concrete. Faith can be broken. It can be found, created. Faith can be changed, and it can change you. Yeah. Because of that, nothing is wholly static, and you're not always able to rely on the magic or even yourself. And there are consequences as without, I'm not going to go into spoilers, but yeah. using this magic system can affect you back and not necessarily in good ways. And I sat down and just started codifying the rules that I wanted with this numinous principle, hoping that once I was done, it would allow me to have the magic system I wanted. And I think it turned out exactly the way I wanted. Yeah, I definitely think that you have uh, done it in the middle. It's like a combination yeah. of the soft and hot magic. You know, that's also kind of the same like sympathy in the King Killer Chronicle. It's mm -hmm. kind of like in the middle, right? But I think I just have to give my praise because uh, uh, for this one, I mean, it's just something that sounds so simple, right? The faith will affect your magic, something like that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it is yeah, it is just so well that I cannot spoil things. Here. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I almost brought it out the things that I want to say. <laughs> yeah. So this is a massive book. As I said earlier, this is 150,000. And you said that a uh, second book might be even bigger than this one. So I'm wondering, do you struggle with the writing process uh, with this series? Uh, no, the only thing I've been struggling with is time. And it's not necessarily that I don't have enough time. It's mm. it, This has just become my life to a degree where I'm, I'm working all day, all night. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm currently, obviously, I'm doing stuff for promotion of book one. We're finalizing stuff for that. Uh, obviously, interviews, uh, cataloging other reviews coming in, setting up conventions, promotional stuff. Mm. But I'm also finishing the, the draft of book two while mm. also editing it because the book is so large. What I normally do with at least this series is by the time I'm close to done, I open a separate document and begin doing separate edits. And by the time I finish book two, I'll have almost caught up to the last few chapters I've written, finish editing those. And then I'll be sort of on my, what I call my first official draft or second draft that I give to my editors. Oh. And this is mostly me fixing things like um, secret symbolism, making sure things add up, continuity, maybe tweaking lines, improving the poetry and the rhyming and the cadence, just like a giant major surgery. Mm. Uh, and because of how big these books are, <laughs> it takes a lot of time out of my day. Um, I think I have the one of the tightest deadlines in the industry right now because no one else I believe is doing books this big on a one book a year schedule. Because mm. Brandon is a stormlight every three years, but I think yeah. he finishes them in two years and takes a year to edit and then release. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> which is a schedule I admit yeah. I kind of wish I had. But... <laughs> you know, Brandon is kind of his own monster anyway. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He's, he's still not... productive while that, obviously. I know. Right now, he's playing Elden Ring while writing books. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's just a show-off. And I mean that with respect. <laughs> I, just, I, wish, I wish I could do that. Um, yeah, but, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nicholas Ames, uh, do you know uh, the author behind the Kings of the Wild and Bloody Rose? He, ba- he basically said that if there's a mutant power that he wants, he wants Brandon Sanderson's power to write. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. yeah. He is a machine, and I respect him for it, not just the work ethic, but I think genuinely it shines through in him and his personality is yeah. he just loves writing. That is the thing he would like to do nonstop if he yeah. could get away with it. Um I mean, that was proof by how he, how he handled the pandemic. He just chose to write more, which I love. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm very much the same way. I just, I'm not at that point in my career where I could allocate that much time to that because I have other things I need to do to, yeah. Well, but personally, I think I definitely see your passion for writing in your books, though, in this one. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. So are you a pencil or a planner? I think I, I predict that you are more of a planner. Believe it or not, I'm actually a pantser. Oh, damn it. <laughs> uh, I know. And people are shocked by that because of this. But it's not that I don't know structure, which is something that people always assume with pantsers. Um, I I don't know if I can say this word, but uh, I'm a, I'll say I'm a craft monkey in that I genuinely love the craft of writing. And I, I do study structure all the time. Mm-hmm. I study different structures because I just love the craft that much. I there's a point some people argue where, you, where you're good enough. I don't personally believe that. I just, I get reward out of pushing myself, which is another reason I wrote this book to teach myself how to write a different style. But that being said, I enjoy the mystery of figuring out how I'm going to get to certain things. But I do know key concrete stuff that I want to do in the story. Like I have the very last page of the entire series written because I just, I, I know what it is. Oh. I, it, that's not going to change. And I know every, the key moments I need to do in book one, three, whatever, to set all that up to get to that final page. And then the rest is, oh, because I've committed to this, I can do this, this, and this that will lead me back to this. Mm. And then, of course, we get to edit. So, I mean, that yeah. is kind of cheating, but it is it is part of the craft too. Yeah. <laughs> I saw on your Twitter that you are reading Fire and Blood right now. So I assume mm-hmm. that you're enjoying it? Personally, I really am. And I'm actually enjoying it more, believe it or not, in audio format, um, only because it adds this extra layer of feeling like it's, it is being told to you by the maesters, like an mm. oral history, which is, or an oral history, which is part of what I always wanted to include in Tales of Tremaine. And it's given me a new level of appreciation for the history of Westeros and George R. R. Martin's world building, because so much of it is just anecdotes, stories. He includes rumors. Um, there are unreliable oh, yeah. narrators like Mushroom, the... Uh, the dwarf jester who he has um it, it's just so beautiful to me and it, it gives you better appreciation for all the events that lead up to the beginning of both the the main body series and then the show adaptation uh it's giving me a better appreciation for the events that lead up to robert's rebellion mostly mm. the background family histories to the point where i'm such a nerd where i, I think i've publicly said this once and obviously george r, r. martin has no idea who i am but <laughs> if he ever wanted someone to write robert's yeah. rebellion I would absolutely be down because I have studied it so in depth. Like, <laughs> I would love nothing more to write that period of time for for the overall history of uh, Westeros. Yeah, yeah. I, I was surprised, you know, when he decided to release Fire and Blood because I thought this will be just a rehash of World of mm-hmm. Ice and Fire, right? But then after I read that Fire, Fire and Blood, I just became more impressed with him because his world building is truly stunning, man. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It is absolutely insane. I mean, the, the details that he has on the Westeros and stuff is just mind-blowing. And it, it gave me a better appreciation for how authors world build because everyone's different. Um, I yeah. think I mentioned I went through the mythology side and storytelling side, stories within stories. You can definitely see, and he's been public about this, that his love is heraldry more than anything. He mm. loves families, code of honors, and this literally starts as just family dynamics. Uh, it, fa- it very much feels like a Greek tragedy. It's um, it's romance, family dynamics. Um, you have mostly just pitting those together. Then what happens when people are being unabashedly people, but they have family weight behind them, power, mm. political mm. power, prestige, obviously dragons, um, money and wealth, and then pride. And he just lets it play out. Yeah. And it just feels like a beautiful natural evolution of that. Like everything that happens in Game of Thrones or the beginning of that completely makes sense when you look at the history and it's like this has just been these powerful families vying for more power or assuaging family wounds and making up for lack of honor or grievances against them 
for 300 years. Yeah, yeah. That's also kind of like the feeling when I first watched or read A Song of Ice and Fire. So back uh, back then when I just started it, I just immediately thought, wow, there's already so much history packed just into the first episode or the first book, right? So many, so many history. And that's why I said that. That's kind of one of the things that I love so much about Happy Fantasy. And that's also what I got from reading the first binding. I mean, just from the introduction for, of Brahms, uh, that's not a spoiler, by the way, for those of you watching this. Yeah. <laughs> just, just the introduction of Brahms, that a lot already tells like, wow, there is so much stuff be- going on behind uh, the stuff that we're we're reading right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I'll definitely admit that uh, studying Fire and Blood definitely taught me a different way to use historical stories mm. as a way to world build. Even if in my world I'm telling a mythological story mm. and this isn't necessarily a real family playing out, it was just such an interesting technique to have maesters reading aloud history and including rumors, gossip. Even if they give the caveat that that's what those are, they're still at least bringing them up. Um, mm-hmm. having the, the, the recorded dialogue by Maesters of like when uh, th- this isn't spoilers because this book is so old at this point but uh, <laughs> when Jaehaerys is marrying Alison yeah. and he's like a, a Maester is forbidding him from doing this and Jaehaerys like t- pretty much shuts him down and tells him like you know you have two choices you can either shut up or I'll take your tongue and <laughs> nobody doubts that because the Maester recorded that and he was there and there were witnesses to that yeah. and it was like that was the first sign people we saw of young Jaehaerys Targaryen showing that he is like the blood of the dragon. And I was like, yeah. that is such a cool little tidbit to include. And then you have things from Mushroom, the, uh, the dwarf jester, yeah, who's yeah. making like very lewd comments and jokes, but then he was present, but he's known to be a liar, but sometimes he's told the truth. Yeah. And you're like, well, this isn't that outrageous of a claim. Is he telling the truth or is the maester telling the truth? But the maester has loyalty to the king and might not want to disparage the family. Mm-hmm. So he might be willing to lie. It was just so cool. And it was like, these are just great different techniques to use, even if I'm going to use them in different ways, how to create other characters to become catalysts for a story being told or parts of a story that you want to use. And then you leave it up to the reader to decide, do you want to believe if it's true or not? And I might tell you later on or no. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm definitely happy that this is part of your inspiration because Song of Us, Song of Us and Fire is one of my favorites too. Oh, same. Yeah. So recently you just announced that uh, the first bonding is the first uh, installment in your um, multiverse, uh, the principal- mm-hmm. principalities. So what made you decide to made it uh, into, into this kind of multiverse? Uh, that came, believe it or not, due to some personal studies I've had where mm-hmm. I've delved into stuff like quantum physics and metaphysics. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a theory I've always weirdly liked, and it's called steinhardt turok theory. Oh. And uh, the way I've always likened it to is, imagine if the universe is a diamond. And obviously diamond has multiple facets, but each one of those facets is a universe unto itself. Now, compositionally, you wouldn't say a, that facet of a diamond is not a diamond. It's still 100% uh, geo, bleh, geologically, <laughs> whatever the, the science word for the chemical composition of a rock, it's still 100% pure diamond, even if it's not the whole diamond, but yeah. it's no less or no more. But there are all these stacks of a facet that make a greater whole. And I always thought that was a fascinating concept. And obviously I grew up reading tons of comics um, and the TV shows have done this forever. And I was just like, I like the idea of a philosophical inspired multiverse where you'll see this in the short story of Path to Kaini, where I want to tackle what would similar situations in a framing narrative Mm. lead to for a character who isn't Ari at all. But if I put him through his world's equivalent sometimes of challenges, what happens? Mm. And you'll see a very different character evolve with a very different philosophy. The storytelling techniques will be different in that world, even though I use a framing narrative. Uh, that one, I don't mind spoiling, is inspired a lot more by things like Berserk, Ooh, nice. Conan, and The Witcher. <laughs> yeah, It's yeah. a very heavier, grittier, dark Asian, South, uh, South Asian story. And I just like the idea of, because um, we have this today too, people talk about multiverse theory, there's memes and jokes about what would another version of you be doing? Yeah. And it just felt fascinating. If I'm telling Ari's story this way, well, what would another version of his story be like if this is all about stories change anyway? What would another story in another universe with different consequences and a different emotional tone being darker look like? And it, yeah. just, it, it just naturally evolved. And I was having stories come to me nonstop and on end. Um, I already know like, how that series would go i have mm. multiple details laid out i've got a series planned for it assuming tor wants to buy it uh, it's <laughs> out of my hands but uh, it, it's just evolved and now the, i have a larger metaverse story to tell yeah uh, well i would definitely keep my fingers crossed for you because uh, after you. after reading this book i am 
I definitely will look out for everything that you release next. Seriously. <laughs> so means a lot. Yeah. So uh, with that in mind, how many books are you planning in the Tales of Jermaine? And when can we expect book two? So I have to be careful how I say this. Because... <laughs> yeah, no, approximately, just approximately. <laughs> what I'm allowed to say is I, yeah. I sold a three book uh, deal contract with Tor and Golanx or Golanx. I actually yeah. don't know how to say their name. Um, <laughs> and before I sold that to them, I told them what the full length of the story would be and that I wouldn't compromise on it. And mm. Tor told me to write the story as I see it fit in my mind. So... With that being said, I think that answers part of the question. Uh, yeah. I've sold three books to tour hmm. and book two will be coming next year. The schedule isn't hundred percent set only yeah. because um, pandemic books, I supply issues, but yeah. I think it'll be still very close to one year from the release of this. If not at worst, they said it might be a month or two late past that. So it's not going to be a two, three year wait. It will be next year. The draft is nearly done. I'm at literally 98% done. Hmm. Um, and I use a, a tracking software based on my word count that I want the book to be finished at uh, the uh, edits I've already gone through. So like, it is 98% done and my deadline's not for another month. So it will be turned in on time. It will go through the regular process and book three will be following that uh, contractually. It will be turned in about, it will release around one year from after book two comes out. So I should be one year, one year, one year. So I believe the series will be wrapped up 2024 or, or 2025 again barring on book supply issues that's it that might yeah. add another few more months just on printing unfortunately but yeah there shouldn't be a long wait for this um, and i do know the story like i said for the first three books yeah well you weren't kidding when you said that your deadline is very tight <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> these are big books and you're planning to release them one book per year <laughs> yeah this is at this point my full-time commitment is writing every day on these books uh, like after this i'm going to go out to get food and then <laughs> just sit down and i sit and write for three to four hours and then i take a break to keep my brain functional and then i spend yeah. the night editing <laughs> Well, I think it's been nice having you here. And I I Me sometimes too. forget, you know, that the first binding isn't released yet because <laughs> I yeah. keep on forgetting that. And that's still about uh, three months, uh, three months, right? Yeah, it comes out August 16th in the States, August 18th in uh, the UK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, less than three months, less than three months. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, how do you feel about all this? I mean, uh, besides that, almost all the praises are very much, well... <laughs> It's very positive. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm still staggered because I've never gotten, I guess, the praise and exposure at this level that I'm seeing now having been indie. It was very quiet and I was comfortable with that. And I would mostly get most of my promotion through conventions and other authors and the few awards I've been very blessed to be up for. And this has been a whole new level. But the feeling has been very odd because part of me is aware it's coming out then. But I'm mm. so in the trenches for book two. Yeah, uh, yeah. production for that and then immediately book three which i start probably about the time i'll be going to conventions to promote book one so there's this dissonance of story-wise i'll be in deep book three yeah and i'll have be having to talk about book one and it, i wonder if this is what actors feel like where they go on two or two years <laughs> yeah. after filming a movie it's all edited and they're like they have to remember everything for that first movie yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. That's true. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming here, Ronnie. As for it me. means a lot to me because, as I said, I love this book so much. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, for those of you who are watching this, uh, if you haven't read the first binding, I truly, truly think that you should give this book a try. And this come out in August. Seriously, it is one of my favorite books. And yeah, I wish you the best of luck, Ronnie. I hope that all of thank your you. future books will be released <laughs> and I can read through them as much as I want to. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye-bye.